Good evening and welcome everyone. My name is Lynn O'Hara and I'm the Director of Programs at National History Day. I'm going to introduce my colleague Cheryl Letterly from the Library of Congress in just a minute, but we'd like to take a moment to welcome you and thank you to coming to our program this evening where we're going to be talking about active learning strategies. Hopefully we're going to give you something to take away tonight whether it's a particular strategy that you want to apply to a primary source, or it's a really cool primary source that you want to dig up and use. I, I know when I was a teacher, I would feel by February that I was kind of in like the doldrums. Like I needed something new. I needed a new idea or a new source or something new to try. So what we're going to do is kind of model and look at some different strategies. Uh, but before we get into that, I'd love to have Cheryl introduce yourself. Thanks for joining us tonight. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me, Lynn. I'm Cheryl Letterly. I'm an educational resources specialist at the Library of Congress. If you have visited the teachers page in the last oh, two decades, you've probably seen some of my work there. I am delighted to be here today and um, hope you learned something new. And if you don't, maybe you'll be reminded of something that you used to do. I know that that was often true of me when I was teaching. It's like, oh, that thing, yeah. So thanks for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. We've been collaborating our two organizations over the past almost four years now on some really cool resources, which we're going to share with you. Uh, two quick notes for tonight. There is not a chat box enabled here uh, because we do use this account with students regularly. However, we do have a Q&A box. Cheryl's going to be monitoring that. She's going to voice some of the things that we put in there. Uh, so please do feel free to use that. She might answer you directly. She might open them for questions, and we'll do Q&A at the end. We also have live captioning enabled. If this bothers you, you can hit the live CC button and turn it off. Uh, please be aware this is computer generated. We don't spell check it. And I'm always a little nervous that it's going to change one word into another word because it does sometimes, but it's some pretty cool AI if you think about it that way. All right, well, we're going to start. And actually, I'm going to go ahead before we jump into our activities and give a little bit of a really cool sneak peek to the group. Uh, I don't know what if you've been on our website in the past day or so, but we have a brand new website. This is something that we're really excited about, and this just went live literally yesterday. So like any new website that's going live, we're working out a few little bumps along the road, and we'll be announcing it later this week. But I wanted to give you a preview of the way that we reorganize the site, because we didn't just say, okay, we want to take the old site and make it prettier. We actually want to think about our users and reorganize the way that we're using it. And I want to give you this tip to help you find some of the resources as well as the resources we're going to be talking about tonight. Our menu bar at the top, and it's mobile compatible as well, starts with contests. So all of the stuff that our students and teachers might be looking for. So resources on the theme, getting started, contest rules, connecting to your local contest as well as information on the national contest. We're so excited to be having you coming back live this June. That's our one stream. Our second stream is teacher resources, things specifically for classroom instruction. We've got classroom tools, which are many of our lesson plans and content areas. And one of the things that I'm really excited with is we have the ability to sort them. So if you take a look, we have a set of series so depending on what you're looking for, these are resources that we have available. And this is a page that is going to continue to grow. To give you a sense, we have three new publications in editing right now. So that'll be out within the next year. In addition to classroom tools, this is where we'll post on upcoming courses, institutes. But also when you're teaching and you're teaching either research skills or advising NHD students, we have specific resources there. Now, some are print resources, some are multimedia. And tonight, we're going to be talking specifically about some work we've done with the Library of Congress. One is a teacher guide and one is a student guide. Now, here's how you tell the difference. Teachers are square, so there's squares on their cover. Students are more bubbly, there's bubbles on their cover. That's how I keep track of them. But the goal of working with these resources is to help make the amazing collection of the Library of Congress and help it be a little more accessible. 
whether you're a teacher looking to use it in lesson plans or you're working with students to pull it into their NHD projects or any other project, quite frankly, that you're doing in class or looking for primary sources. So I wanted to give you a quick sneak peek there. I'll also mention if you've worked with us on our Silent Heroes program, nhdsilentheroes.org is also brand new. We develop these simultaneously. And my favorite part about the website, every time you go there and hit refresh, new images of Silent Heroes will show up. Now it's gonna be a little slow for me just cause I wanna demonstrate it. But I love this idea that every time you go to the site, there'll be new stories. If you go to our gallery, there are 325 profiles researched by NHD teachers and students of those of service members either killed in military service or who survived and died as veterans. So there's some amazing stories, especially as you're planning for Memorial Day. Go check that out. We'll be sharing that as well. All right, that's enough of the preview. Let's get into the good stuff today. What we'd love to do is kind of give you some classroom activities. Now, one of the things that I'm really passionate about is the idea of active learning. And at History Day, I believe that these resources are only good if you can use them. So I wanna direct you to check out our teacher guide and our student guide. And you can grab yourself a digital copy just the way I showed you, or if you missed that, don't worry, we'll link it in the email tomorrow. But what I wanna do is we're gonna drop some activities and look for the purple boxes because this is gonna direct you to where in one of the guides you can find more information. All right, but here it is today, we've gotta to learn by doing. There's far too much in the professional development world that's just somebody talking at you and that's no fun. So get ready, we're gonna have you actively engaged in what we're doing. So for the first activity, these are the instructions. Once we show you the primary source for 30 seconds, we're going to ask you to pause and think. If we were live, we would say, do not talk. Well, in a webinar, we can't really talk, but we can type. But we're gonna say for 30 seconds, we don't want anyone to type anything because we think sometimes when you work with a primary source, you can't jump with the first thing. You've gotta think for a little bit. You've gotta give time to think. And I know as a teacher, I had trouble with that sometimes because I want to rush things along. But we're going to ask you to think, to not say a word, and we're going to challenge you to think outside the box. You ready? Let's have a little bit of fun. All right. The question is very simple. What's this? So for the next 30 seconds, we're not going to say a word. Look closely. Look carefully and think outside the box. Okay going to ask now is for you to go to that Q&A box and put some initial thoughts. What do you think this could be? The rule here is we want everybody to give it a shot. Put something in. You might be right. Chances are you're going to be wrong. That's okay. I think sometimes we have to help our students to not be afraid to give a wrong answer because I think that's what makes history interesting, right? So let's just start, what do you think this is? So just, you know, type it in, what do you think? Everybody put in a guess. And Cheryl will give us some highlights. One thing to notice when we go to talk about these things, there's no way she can read everybody. So please don't think you're being ignored. So sometimes she'll kind of put two together or, you know, but we'd love everybody to take a guess. What in the world do you think this is? So Cheryl, what are some things that our participants have to so say? So far, we have a guess of clogging shoe. Oh. We have maybe the blocks are used to keep the shoes clean. Grips on the bottom of the shoe. Does it help with walking on slippery surfaces? One response says, these are nice pants, so it's not work related. Movie star height corrector. 
<laughs> but he says creates. A, I have not heard that one. I like that one. That's, that's something different. Fun creates hoof prints, tap shoes, lift shoes, something for radio. Oh, I haven't thought of that one either. Uh, lift on one shoe to balance out two leg lengths. So lots of fine array of responses. And what I love about this whole process is it's okay. You, the, the, the idea is not to come up with what it actually is. If that were the idea, we would give you the information because we have it. It's to invite you to observe and think about what you're seeing. All right. Let me follow up with another quick question. Gut sense. What year do you think this photograph was taken? Take a guess. And you know, it's a photograph. So, you know, that, that kind of narrows down our window a little bit. It probably wasn't 1622. I'm just putting it out there. But take a guess. What do you think it might be? Oh, we hear some guesses coming in. Guesses. 1940, 1920, 1935, 1925, 1920s, 1920s. So we're in the range of the 20s and 30s as as far out as the as 1940. Okay. I haven't seen anything after that yet. All right. Let's look at our object now from a different point of view. And what we're going to ask you to do is to enter in what has changed. And maybe your guess hasn't changed at all, or maybe you maybe this makes you think differently or have another idea, or maybe you have a question. So let's start here. Now we're taking the shoe and we're flipping and we're seeing what's on the bottom of the shoe. Hmm. Change your perspective. What do you think it is? Or what does this remind you of? Give me a second to type it in. I'm a former teacher. I have no fear of wait time. A couple of answers coming in. A couple of ideas. So we think this is the 20s, 30s, or 40s. Ooh, now we're getting some good guesses coming in. Oh, I think there's a, a comment you know, that this probably wouldn't help with work, walking on a slippery surface, which was a guess from really. You're right. I, I don't think this would be terribly safe on any kind of wet pavement. I wouldn't want to wear them. Sure. What other guesses do people have? What what direction are they taking this? Um, mostly hooves seem to be consensus, but there are a lot of questions about the purpose. Was it ah, for dancing? Questions do you have? Was mm. it for dancing? Was it for sound effects on radio? And somebody says, well, the looks like a hoof print, but the legs are too close together. So uh, a little bit of, of testing a hypothesis and wondering, maybe not. Clogging well, attachment is another answer. So a couple of a couple of lines of, of dancing and a couple of lines of hooves for various reasons. Uh, well, we can tell you that they weren't for radio. They weren't for dancing. They were meant to look like hooves, but they weren't meant to look like horse hooves. They were meant to look like cows. Hmm. So who might of user, how in the world might these have been used? Dressed in a cow suit? Possible. Cow thieves? Oh, now, we're getting now, now we're getting more in the right frame of mind as to how these shoes were used. Practical joke, thieving, yeah, Chick-fil-A strikes early. I like. Eat more chicken. No, the, these, these were cow hooves 
put on shoes. And again, they're, they're fake, they're wood. But they were used by bootleggers who would try to move. And, you know, in an age before DNA, footprint technology was one way that crimes were solved. And so they made, they basically disguised their footprints as looking like the cows were moving around the pasture. So that's kind of an interesting thing. I love using primary sources. Every time I go out and lead a PD, I always pull one or two or three sources that we don't know what they are. And I like doing this kind of an activity. It's just a quick little, you can do this with students in five minutes and they'll get into gaming who can figure out things. But it's less about getting the answer and much more about the thinking process. And the Library of Congress has so many different things. I, I especially love to use prints and photographs and visual sources for these kinds of activities. It's not exclusive to that, but I love starting with visual sources because everyone can comment. Everybody can see something that they observe it. And that often has, I find if we can get students hooked in the first five minutes of class, then that's gonna encourage them whatever it is you're going to do next. So let's move on, let's do something different. In terms of if you've worked in any capacity with the Library of Congress and its primary source materials, we like to use a method called observe, reflect, question. And we're gonna start, we've got a really cool photograph here and this one's in color. And we're gonna start with just the first phase. Now, observations are exactly that. These are things that you see that most of us quite frankly, can agree on. So for example, I'm gonna start the observation by saying that the woman in the center of the photograph is wearing a pink shirt and light blue pants. For the most part, almost everybody's gonna say, yeah, you're right. So I'd love to start by really taking a close look at this photograph. Go ahead into that Q&A box and drop as many things as you observe. What do you see? What do you think, and we're not even getting into the what's going on, that's the next phase. Because I think sometimes we like to jump to that, like what do you think these women are doing? If we get into that, we haven't paid enough attention to the details. So let's start straight observations. I'd love everybody to put two or three things in the box of something that you see. Now, we know there's gonna be some repetition, that's okay. What are the things that pop out to you at first glance? And what's popping out to you as you look a little closer? All right, Cheryl, what have we got? Oh, I'm sorry, you're muted. No. Oh, thank you. The, the dreaded um, Zoom moment, go ahead. Ah, thank you. Um, we see that there are three women, that there's mm -hmm. a circular structure around them or it's a round space. Mm -hmm. One woman is sitting on a box. All three mm -hmm. women are working with their hands. One woman is on a crate that says department 403. Mm -hmm. They're in a metal tube. They are white. They're mm -hmm. building something. Um, three women in pants. Mm -hmm. so a, an array of possibilities here. This is a great chance to use your descriptive powers. What are some, a lot of you hit the very common things we all kind of hit first. Let's look a little closer. What other small details can we see? Oh, a couple interesting things in here. Uh, the idea of, of are these windows, what, what's the black space that we see in the round object? Lights. Yeah, that fluorescent, it almost looks like a fluorescent tube light, doesn't it? Like the ones that like to be in, in probably in your classroom and they're in my office at work too. Ugh. And there is one participant who thinks those are fluorescent lights. Okay. They're definitely electrical lights, a lot of commentary on the lights. Oh, we're starting to see some comments about the tool. The woman in the blue shirt in the foreground has got some kind of interesting tool in her hand. 
and there's a response about the number of colors. Mm -hmm. One of the things I think it's important to do when we work with students is to give them really time to look, to get past the obvious. Start with that. I always call them those are the fastballs, right? You throw them down the middle, they're big, fat, like there's three of them. We got that real fast. But also then to stop and ask about the little details. And I'll be honest, when you do this with students, they will see things that you have never seen. Quite frankly, they tend to see things better than many adults do. And I love doing this with students. Okay, so now we've got some observations done. We've got to try to start to make sense of this, right? If, if observation is all about looking at the details, we're going to jump to reflection. And I learned this trick from Cheryl. The best way to get reflection going is to ask a very simple question or to give kind of this prompt to help students get going, which is, I think blank because blank. Because you can't just say, well, I think these are aliens and stop there. Well, that doesn't work, right? I think these are aliens because of a particular detail. Now that's something we can talk about. And I'm willing to bet if I think they're aliens, not necessarily everybody's going to agree with me. And that's okay, because we're going from observation to reflection. So let's ask you to do the same. I think blank because blank. What do you think is going on in this photograph? What do you think? I think blank because blank. And if anybody's feeling really stuck on that, um, a couple of people said that they think this is an airplane interior with maybe a question mark. So mm. if you're stuck, you could take, I think this they're working on an airplane because what do you see that makes you say that? Or what do you know that makes you say that? I also like to ask, it's like, well, where do you think this picture was taken? Or why do you think this picture was taken? Or when do you when? think this picture was taken? All good questions to kind of get us going if you need some prompts. We, we, have, uh, we have a why. I think they're part of the war effort because of their clothing and they are all women. Interesting. All right. Here's an issue. I think these women are engineers or mechanics because they're working on something that looks either electrical or mechanical in nature. Okay. I think they are World War II era workers because they look like Rosie the Riveter. I think this is staged. I'd love to know what you're seeing that makes Ooh. you think this is staged. These women are working on a top secret mission for World War II. Well, here's an interesting one. I think these women work in the space program because they look like they're building part of an engine. Oh, so we've got aer airplane. We've also got space here. Hmm. I wonder what clues you might have here. Let's see. Somebody else thinks this is a war munitions plant. So munitions generally are things that are going to blow up or explode in some way. So what clue makes you think it's munitions? Uh, let's see, we've got some another here. Oh, I think this picture wasn't taken in the 1950s or 60s because of the clothes. What specifically about the clothes is leading you to that time period? Oh, here's one more. Uh, the box says department either 40403, which might suggest government issue. Ah, that kind of, you know, that stencil, stencil look that we tend to put with the military, right? We tend to, to, to make that connection. All right, finally, before we start giving the answers, because well, what fun is it if we give the answers at the beginning? What questions do you have? Every time we have primary sources, it generates questions, things you want to know more about, things you're not sure about. 
things that you think are just strange or odd or you just don't know. Because I think questions are part of finishing the puzzle. They're another step that we tend to skip as teachers a little too often. What questions so, and, does and it generate? For national, for national History Day, questions are what advance the research. Absolutely. So what questions do you have? Or maybe I'll ask it a different way. What questions do you think your students might have about this image? How qualified are these women? Mm -hmm. That's one question I see. And what kind of training do you get to work in this job? What job is it? That's a that's an interesting question next to I think this might be staged because their clothing looks too nice and clean to be work clothes. Yeah, these, I mean, I see a little bit of dirt. The one with the navy blue pants right there's something at the bottom of those pants, but I'm going to tell you, these ladies are pretty pressed, right? What is department 403? What space is the tube in? Mm -hmm. You know, where is this picture taken? Let's see, two more questions. Go ahead, John. What other interesting things might you want to know or might your students want to know looking at an image like this? See, so we've got one here asking, is this an advertisement? To join the war, is, is, is there some kind of you know ask going on here? And oh, here's a really good one. I haven't heard this one before. Why are the lights in the tube not on? Well, it looks like some kind of fluorescent, but also the hanging work lights. Right, we see a work light here. We see a work light down here. They're definitely not on. But this is a photograph, right? There has to be light for a photo to work. So there's definitely some kind of light source coming in. Oh, that that's kind of interesting. All right, let's see here. So let's talk about, let's kind of help go to some answers. And I love the Library of Congress because sometimes their photographs have titles which are like the best long-term descriptions of the photos. This is actually, these are women workers who are working on a tail fuselage section of a B-17 bomber in Long Beach, California at the Douglas Aircraft Company. These are the Flying Fortress bombers from World War II. Um, and it's very interesting. So this is a long range, high altitude, heavy bomber with a crew of seven to nine men. Now that plane doesn't look that big for seven to nine men. I'm just gonna put that out there. Um, and this photograph was taken in 1942. It was taken by the US government in the Farm Security Administration. Um, and I love when we find sources like this. And what I'm really going to encourage you to do, if you haven't spent time, is to absolutely go check out loc.gov slash teachers. Cheryl, can you tell our teachers some of the resources on there that they might be able to grab and literally drop into their class tomorrow? Absolutely. Um, there is, first thing I'm going to point out is there are companion teacher's guides with question sets to help you guide your students through the analysis process. There's one for just any primary source, but there are also format specific ones um, for prints and photographs or maps or political cartoons and so forth. And we put those together in conversation with the experts in the custodial divisions because much as Lynn, and all of us love the long paragraph descriptions. Most of the primary sources don't come with that. A lot of them, the people who work with them glean information and put those descriptions together, which is uh, the process that we're inviting you to walk your students through is to observe and bring in your prior knowledge. In addition to these tools, we have primary source sets which are themed sets of resources that, as Lynn said, you can grab and go. Might not give you everything you need, but it might give you a starting point if you find something. And once you find one great resource at the library, then you can follow breadcrumbs in the item record to find more great items. We also maintain a teacher's blog, um, which is keyword searchable and um, 
small bites, a few featured primary sources, a few ideas. They are intended to get you on your way quickly. Those are probably my favorite highlight spots. I'll also mention too, the primary source analysis tool is PDF fillable. And it's set up, it's one of those you can either print out and do by hand, or you can drop into your classroom site and have students pull it down, make their copy and type in. So I think that's really helpful, particularly if you're working with students with special needs or IEPs or different accommodations, that's an easy accommodation that often can help lots of students get going. All right, so we've talked about kind of using primary sources to get students thinking and inquiring. We've done a quick observe, reflect, question. So now what we're going to do is take a little shift and talk about Chronically America. I love Chronically America, and quite frankly, it's one of these resources that just keeps getting a little bit better every year because they keep scanning and digitizing and adding literally thousands upon thousands of pages of local newspapers from across the United States. If you have not been on Chronicling America, it is so much fun and it will waste a whole lot of your time, uh, but you will find some of the coolest things when you're working with students. So we're going to start off by pulling an article from the Daily Worker. This is a newspaper article that ran in Chicago, Illinois on August 9th, 1924. We're going to talk about two specific thinking skills and active strategies, perspective and corroboration. Two big um, HTS, you know, historical thinking skills that you're using every day in the classroom. And what I'd like to ask you really quickly, the Daily Worker, what does that ping in your head? Does that name, I don't know, ring a bell, make you think of something? I mean, just, just knowing that basic information. What might this article be about? Oh, Cheryl's given a, she's given a hint. <laughs> Let's see, what kind of clues might that give us? We have a couple of responses, labor unions, worker rights. Mm -hmm. What's the red sweater reference to? Hint, hint, red, red. Not bad for an English teacher, right? <laughs> See, Cheryl thinks she was an English teacher, but we're turning her into a history teacher. They're really close. Ah, here we go. We've got a little communism maybe going on because worker is a code name, right? And we see that in newspapers at this time, but that's not necessarily something that our students would pick up on. But have no fear, the library is here. Because one of the things that is so crucial when you're working with Chronically American, before we get to the article, every time you find a newspaper, you can click on its name, it's hyperlinked, and get to an about page. So this gives you kind of an overview of this particular newspaper. So based just on looking at this information, Hop in that Q&A box. What do we know about this newspaper? Its perspective, its point of view, and the way that it's gonna look at, quite frankly, whatever topic this article is about, something that's going on in 1924. What kind of clues can we gain, help kind of our students see? I love that people are reading. That's why they're quiet. <laughs> yeah. Take some concentration. It's tiny type. What do we learn about this newspaper just from the about page? I'm going to read a little bit of that second paragraph because it's too good to miss. The, in the January 13, 1924 edition, the paper declared, now in this first issue of the Daily Worker, we join hands with the comrades of the Communist International in declaring that the Daily is but the forerunner of more revolutionary dailies in other parts of the country. Most articles covered events that involved collective labor action, including crackdowns by business owners, strikes, and other forms of collective bargaining. Interesting. So many of you are noting this is, you know, this is a socialist. This is a communist newspaper. It's probably, it's called the Daily Worker. 
So you're definitely going to have a labor focus and a focus on those laborers, like the people doing the work, not necessarily the people directing the work. Now, I think it's interesting to work with newspapers because I think sometimes students look at primary sources and they think that they're good or they're bad, especially our middle school students. They want to put it in a category. And I always say perspective isn't about good and bad. It's actually, it's not black and white. It's really more about shades of gray and looking at different things through different perspectives. And I always used to describe it as like looking through a different pair of glasses. One pair of glasses is going to make things really clear for you. Other things are going to confuse you a little more. Maybe they're going to challenge your thoughts a little more. Uh, but this is the newspaper we're working with. And again, we just picked one. And what we're going to do is take a look at an article on the Great Migration. There's a lot of really interesting new scholarship coming out on the Great Migration. We're actually working on a new lesson on the Great Migration that'll come out this fall. But there's a lot of neat things going on. And found an article in, in the Daily Worker on uh, the title is Negro Migration and Its Causes. Now, my glasses are pretty thick. I can't read that far down. But let's take a look at a couple of quotes that we just pulled from the article. So it's talking about, you know, why African Americans are moving to the Chicago area. And some of the quotes in the article, it is the lack of educational facilities that serves as an impelling cause. African Americans are roughly handled and severely punished by the whites. In the cities and towns, uh, the Negro sections are usually shamefully neglected in the matter of street improvements, sewer facilities, water, and light. And then later on, add to this the horrible lynchings, the burning at the stake of many Negroes whose names never get to our larger newspapers. Hmm. This is kind of interesting. What do you observe about the perspective of this newspaper article? Or maybe I have to say, what surprises you about this? So I'll jump to you while people are, are putting in some ideas. What are some things that maybe surprises you or challenges you about what you know about a newspaper like this and what it had to say? We have a few responses. How ahead of the time the author is. At least on the surface, it seems to be sympathetic to the plight of Black Americans. Mm -hmm. um, an honest reporting of race relations. Yeah, this is, you know, pretty modern interpretation that, that a lot of this, if we read a book written last year, a lot of these issues, whether it's infrastructure or education or racial violence, a lot of these issues would come up, right? We talk about the push factors and the pull factors and why African-Americans are moving north, but also moving west. One of the things that I think is interesting would be to pull this out and to ask students like, how, what do you think about this? Can we corroborate this, right? Because if we look at any one source in history, we're looking at one moment in time and one perspective. But one of the things that I would do is I would ask students to corroborate, to say, hey, let's go into Chronicling America. Are there lots of other articles like this? Are there other articles that tell a very different story or a very different point of view? And I think once students really get into Chronicling America, they really start to find some fascinating gems and some really cool things. And I also love working with newspaper articles because the way they tend to be written, especially once we get into the early 20th century, newspaper articles are written at a relatively low reading level. And that was because while many Americans were literate, they would be literate at what we might consider a fourth or maybe a you know, sixth grade reading level. So a lot of these newspapers are writing for those people. Uh, what I'd love to do is pause for a second and ask you to pop in the box and think of one idea that you could use with newspapers in Chronicling America. What's something you might try with your students? What's something maybe you've done with your students? to help them look at different perspectives 
or to help corroborate different ideas or sources in history. See, it's active learning, you gotta get active too. Let's see, Cheryl, what, what, what's kind of your favorite way to use newspapers when you're working with students or working with teachers that you think is kind of interesting and that Chronicling America is really uniquely suited to do? Uh, chronicling is amazing for lots of things. For one, um, sometimes it's really cool to, to zoom out and see what else was on the page to help build that context. If you're working with a particular article, it can be really instructive to dig into phrasing. So even in the quotations that you pulled, Lynn, or even we don't even have to go back. Even in the headline here, there's word choice that we would not typically use. And that tells you something about the, the, the time in which it was created. Um, I love the fact that newspapers have sections or subheads so that that can help guide student reading and thinking. Um, former high school English teacher, I'm all about the word choice and the perspective. What, what, who was their audience? What choices did they make to appeal to that audience? I love throwing then, a little geography in there too. Like, oh, okay, yeah. if, if the event that you're studying happened in Kansas, obviously you wanna look up how it's playing out in the press in Kansas. But I also say like, how is this playing out in newspapers in Florida? or New York, or San Francisco, or Texas. Because oftentimes an event can have very much different reactions in different parts of the country. I also like to tell our world history teachers. Now, obviously these are US newspapers. It's going to have a US history focus. However, the US is reporting about what's going on in the rest of the world. And if you've got an event in the time frame of Chronicling America, I would absolutely look it up. And I would especially encourage you to look it up in places that have immigrant communities. So if you think of, let's say, an event happening in the nation of Poland, and you look that up with newspapers based in the areas of Cleveland or Pittsburgh or Chicago, where you say, okay, hey, where did Polish immigrants go? And not only something you can find their reactions, Sometimes, especially if you're working with English language learner students, you can find newspapers in other languages. Now, I might not be able to read Polish, but you might have a student who can. And the ability to kind of take advantage of those research skills can really open some great things. Okay, what we'd like to do, we do want to kind of push through it and open up for some good Q&A. Um, I do want to mention, I always kind of think about this when I go to any kind of teaching presentation, I always try to think like, what's something that I could drop in right now? What's something I want to take to the next workshop I lead? What's something that I want to try in my classroom? And I always think like, hey, what's something I need to know a little more about? Because we know that in about 45 minutes, there's no way we can get into all the depth. But we wanted to kind of give you some ideas and whet your appetite. And quite frankly, hope that you're going to download and grab the teacher guide and the student guide, which have far more depth, far more resources, and quite frankly, some of the coolest stuff we found in the LOC collections. So with that, what we want to do to be respectful of everybody's time, we want to go ahead and wrap and shift to a Q&A focus. We understand if you're at the end and you do need to go, but we also love feedback. So please go ahead to the URL, uh, tinyurl.com slash NHD Web 23, I don't get terribly creative with them. Try to keep them simple. Please give us feedback on tonight's uh, presentation. In addition to that, if you're a teacher, this will email you a copy of your responses. Please give that to your supervisor. This is an hour of professional development and we want you to get credit for it. If you don't officially get credit for it, we think it's really important that your administrators know that you're taking time especially in the evening or the late afternoon to join this. So what we'd love to do is pause it there. I'll leave the screen up for a couple minutes. If you have wrapped your evening, thank you so much for joining us. If you have questions you'd like to ask us about the Library of Congress, its resources, you'd like to ask about History Day, 
anything you'd like, we are more than happy to stick on an answer as much as we possibly can. So thank you for joining us and have a wonderful evening. Just to let our audience know, I am going to go ahead and pause the stop the recording now, but please, we're hanging on. We are more than happy to take any questions that you have.